Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. I wanted the courtroom to feel cavernous, and I wanted to sort of feel the full weight of the federal government coming down on these guys and the kind of power that Frank Langella's character, that Julius Hoffman, wielded. What's he doing? He's calming the energy, settling things down. How's that working so far? Second drafts are, are really important. A friend of mine once uh, said about me that uh, I don't write scripts, I rewrite scripts. How much is it worth you? What's your price? To call off the revolution? My life. But uh, I didn't change the script to mirror events. Events changed to mirror the script. You want to avoid all kinds of stereotypes, not just because of uh, racial or ethnic uh, sensitivity. Stereotypes are just bad in, uh, uh, in writing. You, you can write heroes, you can write villains, but there's no such thing as an interesting character who doesn't have a conscience. You're aware that this important story and people's lives and reputations are, are in your hand. Movies are very powerful things. They're seen by a, a lot of people and that to me was, uh, was the more important truth. One of the things that I looked at a lot during prep was protest scenes. For me, so many times in film and on television, they don't look real. I looked at a bunch of movies where I thought, well, they did a really good job. Argo, for instance, what Ben Affleck did with the opening of Argo, archival footage, news footage, stock footage. He cut it together with very tight shots of people he hit stage. We do the same. I got a couple of wide shots, but mostly everything is tight. Just a Billy Club hitting a skull. We were able to do that because we were shooting those protest scenes in Grant Park where they took place. After a, a lot of research, because I knew nothing about the Chicago 7 when I uh, started this, uh, uh, after reading a dozen or so books that have been written, some of them by uh, the defendants, a 21,000 page trial transcript, but most critically, uh, uh, the time I spent with Tom Hayden, who was alive when I started this, he passed away a few years ago, um, uh, is that is what gave me a look into the personal tension between Tom and Abby, two guys on the same side who want the same thing, who plainly can't stand each other and each thinks that the other is harming the cause. What I was gonna say was after the research, there's the period of just pacing around and climbing the walls and trying to figure out exactly what story you're gonna tell. Uh, it, the film organized itself into three stories, what you just said, the, 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 uh, the courtroom drama, the evolution of the riot, how did what was supposed to be a peaceful protest evolve into such a violent clash with the police and the National Guard. And then finally this, personal story uh, between Tom and Abby. Uh, and I decided I'd tell those three stories at the same time and hope for the best. My advice for, uh, for new screenwriters is this. Get a hold of uh, a couple of screenplays of movies that you like and get a hold of the DVD and watch the movie with the screenplay in your lap and kind of read along uh, as the movie goes and you can see what what, what your favorite movies looked like when they were on the page. Keep doing that and you'll start to get the feel of, uh, of what a screenplay is. You walk into the art department, you would see many, many boards of just the aesthetic of 1968 and 69, 70, which is when the trial happened. The one note that I gave everybody at the beginning and then every day after that was don't lean into 60s iconography. Hippies and hard hats, the tie-dye, peace sign, psychedelic aesthetic, because this movie is not about 1968, it's about today. And I want to put as little as possible between the movie and today's audience. Shane Valentino was our production designer, did a phenomenal job, and his, sort of the crown jewel of his production design was the courtroom. The actual courtroom where the trial took place didn't look enough like a courtroom. I was less interested in journalistic accuracy than the truth of the more important story that we were telling. I remember the day where he showed me the different, almost murals that would be on the wall. It was fantastic. I wanted the courtroom to feel cavernous and I wanted to sort of feel the full weight of the federal government coming down on these guys and the kind of power that Frank Langella's character that Julius Hoffman wielded. Caitlin Greenridge says, if you are writing a marginalized character whose identity you do not share, can you imagine your way into that character through their joy 
and not their imagined trauma. Yes, uh, uh, you can. It, empathy, uh, right? The same blood that goes through your body goes through that person. We all have as humans the power to empathize with each other, uh, to understand each other's lives, and to put any character we want into a dramatic situation because the most important thing in your story isn't going to be someone's sexual orientation, their skin color, their religion, whether they are able-bodied or disabled. The most important thing is in your story is going to be intention and obstacle. What does this character want and what's standing in the way of getting it? And I assume that because you're interested in telling this story, you are interested in what the character wants and what's standing in their way of getting it or you think it's a great comic premise with which you can use your sense of humor, or you think it's a great premise with which to tell a murder mystery, or a romantic comedy, or anything like that. But I really think it's important that writers not start to get cautious because they're scared of, uh, of being offensive. Stereotypes should be avoided whether it's as you say, someone from a diverse population or someone who looks exactly like you. Um, you want to avoid all kinds of stereotypes, not just because of uh, racial or ethnic uh, sensitivity. Stereotypes are just bad in, uh, uh, in writing. I can be different in every possible way, but if that person is a father, I'm a father. If that person is also a father, I feel like I know everything about them that's important to know, that you can know uh, uh, as a stranger. I can empathize with that person. You don't want to judge that person. You want to defend that person. You want to be able to make that person's case to God why they should be allowed into heaven. Do not, do not, do not feel that you are required to write about yourself and your world. Write about any world you want. You're making the world. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be yelling at you. I'm just I'm passionate about this. Uh, okay, you, ma'am are not confined by any guardrails. I've been asked a couple of times if I changed the script at all to mirror events, and I didn't. I rewrote the script plenty of times in the, in the 14 years since I was asked to write a movie about the Chicago 7. But just to, you know, in the normal process of a screenwriter rewriting a script to make it better. Um, in, including, by the way, great notes from Paul Greengrass and David Fincher. <laughs> uh, but uh, I didn't change the script to mirror events. Events changed to mirror the script. Uh, look, what, when I started doing this, it was just a, uh, it was a good story to tell. Um, uh, I thought this was, uh, uh, you know, was, I thought this could be a good movie. And then things started to change uh, a few years ago when Donald Trump uh, at his rallies began to get nostalgic about the old days when they'd carry that guy out of here on a stretcher and I'd like to beat the crap out of him. And there was, um, you know, d dissent was being demonized. And that was the atmosphere that we were making the film in uh, last winter. We thought it was plenty relevant when we were making it last winter. We didn't need it to get more relevant. Uh, but then I think it was in May uh, that George Floyd uh, was killed and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery and so protests in Kenosha and Seattle and Lexington and Washington, D.C. and uh, around the country, protesters uh, were being met again by police nightsticks, uh, uh, tear gas. Um, and it was a chilling return to 1968. So, uh, like I said, we thought the film was plenty relevant when we were making it. We didn't need it to get more relevant, but it did. When those sound categories come up at award shows, I am now very interested in who they are. They are truly unsung heroes. And sound is one of those areas of filmmaking where the audience doesn't know that that was a big reason why they loved the movie. I would give notes like when the phone rings in the middle of the night and wakes up Hayden and Bernadine by this news that's coming on the phone. I just kind of said that ring should sound like you were able to get a couple of hours sleep for the first night in a while and just the world is being cracked open. They're able to take a note like that and they create it. It's for state office. You asked about the difference between good and great and oftentimes it's sound. What we were making with Chicago 7, 
or with Molly's Game or with Charlie Wilson's War or The Social Network or Steve Jobs is a painting and not a photograph. Because I don't feel that the important truth is what size the courtroom was. I feel that the more important truth was the fact that the Justice Department was engaging in politics and eliminating political enemies of this newly elected president, Richard Nixon. You're aware that this important story and people's lives and reputations are, are in your hand. Movies are very powerful things. They're seen by a, a lot of people. And that to me was, uh, was the more important truth. Now, uh, Aaron, 2020 has been one for the books. I'm curious, does watching a year like this play out make you want to write about it? And what would the finale look like? Please tell me it won't be Revenge of the Murder Hornets. Uh, it wouldn't be if I wrote it. Uh, I think. But uh, listen, a lot will be written about these uh, about these last few years uh, by screenwriters and by playwrights. But uh, my my prediction is that you'll never see Donald Trump as an on screen character, that he'll always be off screen, that you'll see him on televisions and news footage because he's simply implausible as a character. Uh, and I, you, you can write heroes and you can write villains, but there's no such thing as an interesting character who doesn't have a conscience. I've been watching your work be directed by some of the greatest filmmakers of all time for years. Rob Reiner, obviously David, uh, David Fincher doing Social Network, Danny Boyle's brilliant work on Steve Jobs, Miller's work on uh, Moneyball. Um, and I wonder, as you were watching these films become the movies they were based on your screenplays, what elements of those directors and the way they approached your material changed the way how you become the filmmaker you are today. I mean, are there things you can pinpoint from specific films or directors that you go, all right, that director really approached my material this way and that influenced the director that I became on this film and Molly's Game? Yeah, I would say, and also added to the uh, list of directors you named Mike Nichols. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tommy Shlami uh, in television uh, as the principal yeah. director of the West Wing. Uh, you would have to really not be paying attention uh, to stand next to these guys for uh, for as long as I was able to stand next to them and not pick up anything. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, so I I I I try to um, well I try to steal as much from them uh, as I can. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I've watched the way they work, um, and I either think, uh, well, that's that's a shoe I could fit into, or you know, that's that's not how I would uh, want to work. Um, uh, mostly, what I try to pay attention to <clears throat> is stuff that speaks to my blind spot, a literal blind spot, which is that I, I have a very weak visual sensibility. Um, I, I've spent my life paying attention to how movies, television shows, and plays sound, uh, and not as much attention to how they look. Um, but I'm told that uh, the visual element in cinema is important to some people. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm trying to get better at that. Was there something specifically from Fincher, um, like on social network specifically that you learned? Yes, but in the way a freshman uh, would pick up a little something from a guy who's teaching a PhD course uh, uh, in something. Like you could sit in the class and maybe you could pick up a couple of things, but there's so much you have to learn before you can understand what, what he's talking about. With David, I'm talking about specifically the care he puts into uh, creating a frame. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen him spend hours uh, on an exterior shot trying to get just a little spill of light from a street <laughs> lamp that's two blocks away. <laughs> um, and, you know, I would think to myself at the time, boy, I don't know if this really makes that much difference, this spill of light. And then I'll look at a shot of mine that really could have used a spill of light from the street <laughs> lamp. So I'm learning the hard way, but I'm learning. All right, Holly Jack, uh, people who write stuff, how do you approach second drafts? Blank page and start again? Amendments to what you've already got? Any thoughts, tips would be appreciated. Yeah, great. Second drafts are, are really important. A friend of mine once 
uh, said about me that uh, I don't write scripts, I rewrite scripts. And here's what he meant. In the process of writing the first draft, by the time you get to the end, you've sort of discovered what the movie is about. Uh, because it may not end up that first draft being about what you thought it was going to be about when you started writing it. You plotted a course to go due north, but as you were going, you, you started going uh, a little bit east and then a little bit more east. And, and when you end up, you're, you're going northeast. So you figured out uh, what the script is about. It's probably fat. It's probably long. Go back to the beginning of the script. Start writing it over again. Peel away the things that don't have anything to do with your story. Hang a lantern on the things that you need to bring into relief uh, in the story. You're going to discover that a problem that you have in the third act isn't really in the third act. It's because you didn't set it up properly in the first. So, second drafts, I say retype the whole thing. Sharpen up that joke that's kind of clunky. Sharpen up that's di that dialogue that's kind of clunky. Get it down to its fighting weight. That's what I do anyway. Thanks a lot for the question.